Among the things that Dickinson publishes is a song <laughs> that becomes very popular. It's called the Liberty Song. Come join hand in hand, brave Americans all. Notice the use of the word Americans. And rouse your bold hearts at fair liberty's call. No tyrannous acts shall suppress you, just claim, or stain with dishonor America's name. In freedom we're born and in freedom we'll live. Our purses are ready, steady, friends, steady, not as slaves, but as freemen our mercy will give. Our speaker tonight is uh, William Fowler, who's a distinguished professor of history emeritus at Northeastern University. Dr. Fowler is also a former director of the Massachusetts Historical Society, where he served from 1998 to 2005. Uh, Dr. Fowler received his undergraduate degree from Northeastern University and his PhD from the University of Notre Dame. In addition to being a former editor of the New England Quarterly, Dr. Fowler is the author of a number of books related to American history, quite a number in fact, uh, including Rebels Under Sail, The Navy and the Revolution, The Baron of Beacon Hill, a biography of John, John Hancock, which relates directly to what he's going to be talking about tonight, Jack Tars and Commodores, The American Navy, 1783 to 1815, and the French and Indian, excuse me, Empires at War, the French and Indian War, and the struggle for North America, 1754 to 1763, which is really, really, a really uh, very good book. And most recently, Steam Titans, Cunard, Collins, and the epic struggle for commerce in the North Atlantic. Well, thank you, Pat. That was very kind of you. A few moments ago, Pat asked me uh, what I would like him to say in introducing me, and I suggested that he ought not to fear to exaggerate. So thank you very much. And, and that introduction lifts up my spirits, and uh, sometimes introductions are not so uplifting. A few weeks ago, I was in the western part of our Commonwealth, getting ready to address a local historical society, and they were having their annual meeting. And as part of that meeting, of course, the treasurer was giving her report. And in process of giving her report, the treasurer announced to the group that indeed they were doing very well financially and that in the future they'd be able to afford better speakers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. It was a glorious moment. After nearly nine years of war, a war that had begun in western Pennsylvania, sparked by the reckless actions of a young Virginia militia officer named Washington, the French and Indian War had begun. In Europe, it became known as the Seven Years' War, but here in America, it lasted nine long years. It was the world's first world war. It was fought on nearly every continent between the world's two great superpowers, Great Britain and France. In the end, Great Britain won. She became master, mistress of an empire not seen since the days of Caesar Augustus. Britannia was joyful, and so too was Boston. We were, after all, proudly part of this triumphant empire. From the balcony of the old state house, Governor Francis Bernard read the proclamation announcing the end of the war. Huzzahs of joy, parades, demonstrations here and elsewhere. The dastardly French were gone. This happy event. But over the horizon, there were certain, not yet dark, but shall we say gray clouds. Not all had gone well during the war. American colonials were resentful at the pretentiousness of British officers. Washington, in particular, had felt that bite. One of the British commanders-in-chief, Lord Loudoun, had so antagonized Americans that he was recalled. The Americans resented this sort of colonial treatment. On the other side, the British were not too happy either, for they knew full well that during the Long War, the Americans, if we can use that term, and the New Englanders in particular, 
had done extensive trading with the enemy, illegal trading. The real problem, though, was money. William Pitt, the great British Prime Minister, had for the most part directed the war, and he had directed it by opening up the exchequer, the purse. He spent and spent and spent and spent, won the war, but at the end of the war, the British government was in debt. National debt was 140 million pounds, more than twice what it had been before the war. How to pay this debt? 1763, in the fall, came an announcement that was annoying, but not particularly troublesome. His Majesty had declared a proclamation line that went down across the summit of the Appalachian Mountains. There would be no settlements further west of this line. The Americans were deeply disappointed, after all. To them, that was the Garden of Eden. That's why they had driven the French out, so they could have that territory. But on the other hand, they knew full well that it was unenforceable. No one was going to prevent them from going west. So while it was irksome, it wasn't terribly serious. The line, the proclamation line, was not a great threat because it was unenforceable. But then the debt, who should pay it? Whose debt was this? The British people were taxed by the standards of the time fairly heavily. And it was a common notion in England that the war had in great measure been fought to help the American colonials, which was true. Why then should they not help to pay off this debt. As Parliament considered this, there were two overriding principles that guided them. One, the economic principle of mercantilism. That is to say, a belief that in the world it was a zero-sum game. That as one empire won, another empire would lose. It was a matter of scrambling and grabbing for trade, which meant that you had to protect your system now, this was a philosophy common to all empires at the time. It wasn't simply British. The theory was, and the reality was, that the colonies were intended to provide raw materials for the mother country, and then to provide a market for manufactured goods that would come back from the mother country. It was a closed system. Foreigners were not invited to participate. In those instances where you had to have foreign activity, Madeira wine, for example, then that would, wine would be heavily taxed and it could only be carried in British ships with British sailors, British built. That was mercantilism, a very protective system. And then a second element had to do with parliamentary supremacy. And that is to say, there was no question no question whatsoever in the minds of the members of Parliament that Parliament was powerful in all matters whatsoever. Now, to be sure, parliamentary supremacy had not been on the front burner for some time, but it was there, real in the minds of the members of Parliament. Parliamentary supremacy would become one of the key elements one of the key elements in the dispute that is about to emerge. The mercantilist system was managed and controlled by a series of laws, dozens of laws, complicated laws, enforced by a regiment of customs officers. The laws had begun in 1660 and had continued on. Complicated, but not strictly enforced. In point of fact, in the early part of the 18th century, if the laws of navigation laws, if these laws had been enforced, they would have encountered dissonance from the Americans. But the British ministries, particularly Sir Robert Walpole, were content to do as Sir Robert once said, let sleeping dogs lie. It was a common notion here in Boston and elsewhere, as far as the customs officers went, 
that the merchant's pay was surer than the king's. Bribery was rampant. It was a system that was idiosyncratic, but in a bizarre way, it sort of worked. But now to supremacy. We can get a sense of how Americans felt about parliamentary supremacy very early on. In 1651, the town of Sudbury, Massachusetts, was having a dispute within the town, having to do with fences. This dispute managed to reach Boston. And so the general court of the province of Massachusetts Bay decided that they would send a committee to Sudbury to help the people of Sudbury solve their problem. When this committee arrived on the outskirts of the town of Sudbury, they were met by Mr. John Ruddick, chairman, selectman, the town of Sudbury. He told the committee, we shall be judged by men of our own choosing. Go home. There is the first sign on a very local level of this strong feeling of self-government and independence, whether it was in Boston or London. Gradually, over the years, the decades, this letting sleeping dogs lie, not enforcing the laws, et cetera, et cetera, the colonies, particularly a place like Massachusetts, grew increasingly comfortable with a high degree of de facto self-government. And Parliament never bothered to challenge them. There was no need. It was a comfortable relationship. That comfortable relationship now will come apart because of the need for revenue, for money. Having made the Proclamation Act of 1763, in the next year, 1764, Parliament enacted the Sugar Act, or the American Act, as it was known. This was an act not just to regulate commerce, as had been the issue before. This was an act explicitly, as Lord Grenville announced it, to raise revenue. And Grenville, the Prime Minister, announced that it was just and necessary that an American revenue be raised. To be sure that it would be enforced, he added more customs offices. They increased duties on foreign molasses, as it was called, and other foreign products as well. The Americans, when hearing of this, resisted. But for the moment, they resisted on the basis of economics, that this was simply bad legislation, that it would be harmful to American commerce, which was certainly true. They did not, at this particular moment, raise any special concerns about any constitutional issues, about the matter of taxing or raising revenue. This was simply, for the moment, inconvenient. Even before the Revenue Act had a chance to make its impact, Parliament passed another measure, revenue measure, the Stamp Act, March 1765. This, too, was clearly for revenue. There was no regulation here. This was revenue. By the provisions of this Act, various documents had to have stamps affixed to them. You would have to go and purchase these stamps from the stamp master. Stamps were required on legal documents, deeds, college diplomas, newspapers, licenses, such as tavern licenses. Strictly a revenue measure. It was the imposition of this now a direct tax. There was no question here about parliamentary authority. They were now directly taxing Americans. Resistance. The emergence of an organization called the Sons of Liberty. The royal governor thought of them as sons of something else. Parading through the streets, well organized, defying the royal authorities, and making life generally miserable for anyone who sided with the dreaded stamp masters, that is, the men who sold these stamps. On the night of August the 14th, 1766, 
They sacked all of his, Andrew all of his home. He was the stamp master. Six days later, August 20th, they sacked the home of Thomas Hutchinson, the governor, the lieutenant governor at the time, just up the street from the Paul Revere House. Similar violent actions broke out in the other colonies as well, protests against the Stamp Act. Courts were closed because no one would purchase the stamps. Justice was delayed. It was so violent here in the town that the royal governor, Francis Bernard, took refuge in Castle William. We know it as Castle Island out in the harbor. Sought safety there. The uproar was so great in the colonies that the merchants of London were so distressed at the loss of trade and business that they brought pressure on Parliament to repeal the Stamp Act, which Parliament did. They repealed the Stamp Act, but not before they also passed another act, the Declaratory Act. Lest there be any question, Parliament explicitly stated that they were powerful in all matters whatsoever. So while they might retreat from the Stamp Act, they were not retreating from parliamentary supremacy. That was intact. But they still had the problem. Money. This was about revenue. And they had yet to find the solution to that. In the midst of this, English politics need to be looked at. Instability. Between 1760 and 1770, there were eight, eight different ministries. There was Pitt, who resigned in 1761, followed by the Duke of Newcastle, followed by Lord Bute, followed by Grenville, Rockingham. Pitt comes back again, followed by Grafton, and finally in 1770, Lord North. But think for a moment. While the British Parliament and ministers are trying to design pressure, a strategy, there is chaos in their own midst. In the meantime, they have a young king on the throne. George III came to the throne in 1760 upon the death of his grandfather. A young king, an ambitious king, who intended to have his influence felt. He was the first of the Hanoverian kings to be born in England and to be able to speak fluent English. He saw himself as the grand politician, not, not a god king, but a politician. Instability then in the ministry, trying to deal with these very serious problems. Into this midst comes one of 18th century England's most fascinating politicians, Charles Townsend better known in his own time as Champagne Charlie. It was reported that Charles Townsend could give a speech in Parliament in the morning in favor of a measure. And then after lunch, he'd give the same speech against the same measure. He was not a man troubled by principle. And Townsend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer now, that is the Treasurer, announced on January 26th, 1767, he announced, I have a plan to raise revenue in America without giving offense. And then he sat down. And the members wondered, what's next? What is the plan? Townsend was playing a game, but the game was up a few months later when the plan to raise the land tax failed. <laughs> Financial problems now were even more severe. Townsend had to deliver something. And so the infamous Townsend Acts. The king gave his assent to them on July the 2nd. The tax was levied on a number of things. Levied on glass, and paper, and tea, and lead, it's a very long, long list of duties that were now being levied via this act on products imported into the colonies. So the king signs it on July the 2nd, 1767. On September the 4th, 
1767, Townsend died. He never had a chance to view the wreckage that he had brought forth. In one of the obituaries, it was noted that Charles Townsend, they said, there never was a man who left his affairs in such disorder. And indeed, it was true. For the purpose of enforcing these duties, the Townsend Act also created a board of five customs commissioners. Uh, this was not particularly unusual, but ordinarily in past instances, customs commissioners, that is the men responsible for overseeing the customs service, it was a bit of a sinecure, and they usually resided in London, comfortably in London, leaving the business of collecting out in the colonies. But now those five commissioners were going to be sent to America. Now, when one wonders what would possibly be the single worst place to send these five very unpopular men, what hornet's nest could you find that you might insert them into? Why Boston, of course. And so the commissioners were to take up residence here in this town. The news arrives in August. There's talk of non-importation, boycotting, but it's relatively quiet, relatively quiet. Uh, the town meeting meets and votes to avoid superfluities, but we won't have any luxuries here. Well, it's rather modest. They're going to boycott things such as snuff, mustard, silk, because the towns and acts threaten our ruin and poverty. But on the other hand, somewhat quiet. Down in Philadelphia, there's an American patriot, John Dickinson, and Dickinson writes a series of letters that are published throughout the colonies. Letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania to the inhabitants of the British colonies. And what Dickinson argues is that Parliament cannot impose duties to raise revenue, direct taxes. What Dickinson is doing is raising an issue not of economics now, but of constitutionality, a far more serious issue, a very fundamental issue. Among the things that Dickinson publishes is a song that becomes very popular. It's called the Liberty Song. Come join hand in hand, brave Americans all. Notice the use of the word Americans. And rouse your bold hearts at fair liberty's call. No tyrannous acts shall suppress you, just claim or stain with dishonor America's name. In freedom we're born and in freedom we'll live. Our purses are ready, steady, friends, steady, not as slaves, but as freemen our mercy will give. And Dickinson's letters drew a wide audience, again raising this issue, a fundamental issue, about the power of Parliament. At about the same time, the Massachusetts General Court takes action. They write a letter, a letter that they write, approve, and send to the other colonies. It is a rather long letter, but it asserts the rights of the colonies, and again, the unconstitutionality of the Townsend Acts. Still, though, things are relatively uneventful. In fact, the royal governor, Francis Bernard, in the midst of this, writes to the Earl of Shelburne. He tells the Earl, quote, upon the whole, I flatter myself that this government will soon come to rights unless some new cause of uneasiness should arise, which is not now to be foreseen. Well, in December, things began to become foreseen. The town meeting urged industry and frugality. And then in February of 1768, this circular letter was in fact written and sent to all of the other colonies. The heart of it was, quote, the acts imposing duties on the people of this province with the sole express purpose of raising a revenue are infringing on their natural and constitutional rights. And so, the dispute is being elevated. Bernard's response to this letter in February is that it's seditious. He dissolves the house, 
telling the members to go home. But then there begins a bit of intimidation in the town. These Sons of Liberty, created during the Stamp Act, have not gone away. And we see some comments about what's going on in the town. A quote, Mr. Birch had a large number of men with clubs assembled before his house a great part of the evening, and he was obliged to send away his wife and children by a back door. He, of course, was a royal official. And then there was the proverbial Hillsborough treat. Lord Hillsborough was the Secretary of State for the colonies. The Hillsborough treat was cow dung thrown against your front door. Evidence of discontent. Tensions were, in fact, rising. Enter John Hancock, 30 years old, Harvard graduate, had lived in Quincy, had been sent to live with his family in Lexington, and as a young child left Lexington to be raised by his uncle Thomas and Aunt Lydia, who had no children, in a lovely mansion atop Beacon Hill, right next to where the state house is today. It was torn down in 1863. Uncle Thomas, one of the richest men in Boston, died in 1764, and John inherited the business. Here he is, wealthy, ambitious, ambitious more politically than in a business way, a bachelor. He was elected a selectman of the town in 1765 and elected to the House of Representatives in 1766. He was an ally of Samuel Adams, but uh, not always. In these mid-60s, John Hancock was an uncertain ally. Uh, he was a bit of a trimmer. Uh, he was very ambitious. We ought not to, when we look back with hindsight, we can see what is going to happen, but 1764, 65, we didn't know what was going to happen, and he sort of, on occasion, uh, was courted by the royal governor and the governor's friends. But he did nonetheless drift towards Adams, the Sons of Liberty, and the Patriots. And he went to antagonize the royal governor, Francis Bernard. When the commissioners arrived in Boston, the customs commissioners, John Hancock, who was colonel of the governor's guard called the cadets, the ancestor of the first corps of cadets here in Boston today, it was the custom that the cadets were the governor's personal guard and was expected to turn out for events. The governor ordered the cadets to turn out and Colonel Hancock refused. He would not turn out the cadets to welcome the commissioners. Hancock also refused to attend any social event at which the commissioners were present. Now, that might not seem very serious, but he was the most eligible bachelor, the wealthiest man in town, the, on the eye of everyone, and he wouldn't go to any social event where the commissioners of customs were present. It annoyed Francis Bernard to no end. Hancock and Bernard became foes. And well, the evidence is not always clear to an historian. As you read the documents and the reports, it does seem to me that in this unhappy relationship, the governor and his allies had their eyes pointed towards John Hancock as the symbol of resistance. He was an annoying and very visible person. He became, in some ways, their target. On April the 9th, 1768, Hancock's vessel, Lydia, arrived in Boston, named for his aunt. As was the custom, two customs officers went aboard the Lydia. They tried to search her, but Hancock and his men turned them away. Turned them away because they did not have a writ of assistance. They did not have a warrant to search the vessel. They didn't have a legal right to search the vessel. So Hancock's men threw, literally threw, 
the two customs officers off the vessel. The customs commissioners went immediately to the attorney general of the colony, Jonathan Sewell. Jonathan Sewell was one of John Adams' closest friends. They had practiced law together. They had stayed at one another's house. And they would remain friends, by the way, through the turmoil that's about to come. Attorney General Sewell told the commissioners, no, you have no right. You have no writ. You have no legal standing. Sewell refused to give them authority. The commissioners appealed to London. You know, if the Attorney General won't do what you want him to do, can we get someone higher to order the Attorney General to do what we think he ought to do? And the ministry in London said, no, <laughs> the evidence is not there. And so Hancock won first time. At this time, it is John Adams, the lawyer in Boston, who is known to Hancock, they were not necessarily friends, becomes Hancock's attorney. And then, shortly after the Lydia affair, another vessel arrives in Boston, Hancock's sloop, the Liberty. This was particularly annoying to Bernard because Liberty was named in honor of John Wilkes. John Wilkes was a radical member of Parliament who had spoken ill of the king and of many other people for that matter, a newspaper editor, he had a newspaper, and for his outspoken remarks, they threw him out of Parliament. In fact, they threw him in the Tower of London. John Wilkes became a symbol of free speech and freedom of the press. And so, Liberty, Hancock's Liberty was named in honor of John Wilkes, kind of putting his thumb in the nose of Frances Bernard. She arrives on the 9th of May. As usual, customs officers go on board, the cargo was offloaded. There seemed no particular issue, a problem here. Uh, in the cargo, by the way, was a fair amount of Madeira wine. Uh, Madeira was a special favorite in the colonies. Uh, Madeira wine, obviously, from the Madeira Islands, a foreign wine, so had to pay a duty. Uh, it was said that Madeira wine actually benefited from the long voyages, the movement of a ship across the Atlantic uh, produced a finer wine and some sort of aging process. So it was very popular, very popular indeed. So for the moment, all seemed well. Cargo was unloaded, duties paid. And then about a month goes by after the 9th of May, and there comes a time for another event. It was the custom for the governor to host a public dinner in Faneuil Hall on the annual election day. It was a dinner to which all of the royal officials were invited, held annually, a sumptuous meal in Faneuil Hall. And again, it was expected that the cadets would turn out to escort the governor. Again, Hancock told him, no. The governor ordered him to turn out the cadets. He said, no, again. And then the town refused to allow Governor Bernard to use Faneuil Hall for the banquet. A huge insult to his excellency. Two days, three days after these events, on June the 10th, Thomas Kirk, who had been one of the customs officers who had boarded the Liberty about a month before and had made no report of any smuggling or suspicious activities, on June the 10th, Thomas Kirk granted an affidavit asserting that while he was aboard, Hancock's men threw him down below in the hold of the Liberty and for the next three hours, he could hear men offloading a cargo. Now, this was in complete opposition to what he had not said a month earlier. And his affidavit follows this rather rocky bit of business with the governor. Using Kirk's affidavit, Sewell ordered the seizure of the liberty. Out in the harbor was HMS Romney a 50-gun frigate of Her Majesty, His Majesty. She had been sent 
to uh, demonstrate the power of the crown with their open gun ports. Expecting that there would be some trouble here, might be, Romney's Marines in two boats came ashore to seize the Liberty. In the meantime, of course, a crowd gathers at Hancock's Wharf, yelling and screaming, uh, occasional rock thrown here and there, cursing the Marines. And the Liberty is towed out into Boston Harbor to be under the stern of Romney, where she's safe and away from those rascals. Meanwhile, in the town, riots break out, windows are broken, the usual stuff. Discontent, violence in the town now. The commissioners become alarmed. The governor becomes alarmed. They ask for troops to come to Boston. Their letters are near panicky about the terrible things that are going on. On the 6th of June, Lord Hillsborough dispatches orders to General Gage, then in New York City, to send two regiments of troops to Boston to maintain order. The troops are coming. In the meantime, Hancock, the businessman that he is, wants liberty back. And so he writes to the commissioners saying, I will post bond if you'll give me back liberty. He sent that message on June the 11th, the Saturday, June the 11th. The commissioners immediately accept the offer, good deal for them, and tell them, we'll return the vessel to you on Monday. Sunday, June 12th, there is a meeting at Hancock's home atop Beacon Hill. We don't know the entire list of attendees, but among those present, Hancock himself, of course, Samuel Adams, James Otis, James Warren, and probably a few other Bostonians. They told Hancock that he was being a fool, that if he accepted the commissioner's offer, posted bond, got his vessel back, he would be, in a sense, admitting to guilt. Stand your ground, John. You may lose the vessel, but you'll be a hero to the town. Well, that certainly appealed to John Hancock, being a hero to the town. No deal. Hancock reneged on the deal. No deal. You keep, let liberty stay there in the harbor as a visible symbol of customs racketeering. The letter, that circular letter that I mentioned a few moments ago that had been approved February the 11th and sent to all the colonies. When that letter reached London, Lord Hillsborough immediately sent instructions to Governor Bernard that he, the governor, was to order the general court to rescind the letter. The general court refused to rescind the letter by a vote of 92 to 17. They would not rescind the letter. The governor could not order them, a legislative body, to do such a thing. On the 22nd of June, the next day, Attorney General Jonathan Sewell filed a libel based against liberty, based upon Kirk's affidavit, and thus begins a long, torturous legal case to which, in which John Adams is central. He acts as Hancock's attorney. While the case is pending in the courts, on October the 1st, the troops arrive. Think for a moment what that must have meant. Population of Boston today in 1768, 69, was roughly 15,000 people. There now arrived two regiments of troops, and probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 troops, maybe a few more, because there was some artillery that came as well. So what percentage of the population might that be? How would we feel today in Boston 
We have a population of roughly 600,000 people. If suddenly there arrived in this community 50, 60,000 combat ready troops to impose on us unpopular laws, who were visible in the streets, their uniforms, the bright straps, the glistening bayonets, the lobster backs. It was a horrendous moment to see here in this town a sort of occupation by troops. Sewell, hoping to keep tempers down a bit, waited now. When the troops arrived, there followed a few weeks of just tension but calm. But then, on October 29th, he filed against Hancock and five others, personally, not against the Liberty. That was a different matter. That was a, a case in Vice Admiralty Court. That's a different matter. But now, on October 29th, Sewell fil filed charges against John Hancock and five other men for smuggling, claiming that they had smuggled in 100 pipes of Madeira. The penalty? 9,000 pounds each man. That's a huge amount of money, huge amount of money. Warrants were issued, the men were arrested, and then bail was posted and they were out on bail. If the Crown succeeded in this prosecution, these men would end up paying a lot of money. And at the time, of course, in matters like this, when fines were paid for disobeying the laws of smuggling, the rewards went one-third to the Crown, one-third to the Governor, and one-third to the informers or customs agents. If you do the calculation, should the prosecution succeed, Governor Francis Bernard turned to get 18,000 pounds, which was roughly 12 years of his salary. A bit of incentive. And so Hancock relies on John Adams. Call John. He was the best lawyer in town. And he had recently concluded another admiralty case. So he was sort of primed for this. Uh, the Crown had a very weak case. All they had, really, was the affidavit of Thomas Kirk, who seems to have perjured himself. There were no other witnesses. The Attorney General sought for witnesses, interviewed many, many people in secret, in a sort of star chamber environment, which was really repulsive to the people of Boston. And when you look at it, repulsive to the dictates of common law at the time. But they were determined to get these guys. They searched John Hancock's office. Can you imagine that? Searching an office. All of this was reported in the Journal of the Times. The Journal of the Times was a propaganda sheet that came out periodically reporting all of the terrible things that were going on in Boston. The rape and rapine, the murder, the assaults by the British troops against law-abiding citizens, horrible stories, and reporting to these customs offices the viciousness of the governor and his minions. And the Journal of the Times circulated throughout the colonies. The frontier of liberty was on the Charles River. What they're doing to us here now, they will do to you. Now, to be sure, the Journal of the Times was, had a bit of fake news in it, okay? but it certainly did the job. Did the job. And of course, all of this reached London as well. <laughs> the ministers were distressed. This is about money, Sir Francis. He will shortly become Sir Francis Bernard. No. Every, this is an uproar in the town. What we want is money. This whole issue started because we need revenue. And look what you have brought us. Of course, Parliament had brought it too. Bernard's position is very shaky. Very, very shaky. He's losing friends. The council charged him with unmanly dissimulation. He was a liar. Bernard, in, retro, in revenge, removed the general court from Boston and sent them to exile in Cambridge. 
the House voted to ask His Majesty to recall the governor. In the meantime, the commissioners haven't won any friends either, and there's growing uneasiness. They have proven and demonstrated in some ways a bit of corruption and self-dealing here. Their hysterical cries for protection from the troops had not really gone well in London. Again, the plan was to raise money, not to raise hell. Jonathan Sewell, the Attorney General, who seems to be a decent man, is in the midst of this. In fact, John Adams, his good friend, described his friend, Jonathan Sewell. He wrote, he possessed a lively wit and a pleasing humor, a brilliant imagination, great subtlety of reasoning, had an insinuating eloquence. I know not that I have ever delighted more in the friendship of any man or more deeply regretted an irreconcilable difference in judgment in public opinions. He had virtues to be esteemed, qualities to be loved, and talents to be advanced. But he was my enemy. It was a mess. It was a mess in Boston and a mess in London as well, as the ministry and parliament tried to grapple with these issues. The evidence in the case against Hancock was very, very weak. On March the 25th, 1769, Sewell announced, quote, the Advocate General has leave to retract those charges and says our Sovereign Lord the King will prosecute no further herein. Sewell, on the instructions from London, dropped the case against Hancock because it was so weak. The Journal of the Times had a heyday, for here was proof, proof of what had been going on, of this terrible thing, oppression, illegality, rapaciousness, racketeering against decent citizens. In the meantime, the towns and acts are failing. These were intended to raise revenue. They're not raising revenue. They're inspiring boycotts. They're inspiring violence, false prosecutions. There's great unrest. And so Grafton, the king's minister, resigns. Number seven to go by. And he is replaced by the king's very good friend, Lord North, in 1770. Uh, Lord North, by the way, will bring stability to the ministry. He will be the king's prime minister until the fall of 1782. Uh, that's good news, bad news, of course, uh, because North's opinions and his actions were not necessarily in the interest of the empire. But he did bring stability, and he and George III managed things, but not so well. On March the 5th, March the 5th, 1770, a day known here in Boston. On that day in Parliament, Lord North presented a motion in Parliament to partially repeal the Townsend Acts, but to assert the right of Parliament to tax Americans, he kept the duty on tea. I wonder how that's going to work out. <laughs> and so what do we see here in these events, in this tumultuous decade? Was John Hancock a smuggler? Well, truth is that Hancock's business, which was primarily across the Atlantic with, with England, really didn't require smuggling. Was he a smuggler? Well, you know, Smugglers, good smugglers, don't leave good records. And so we can't say for certain, probably, you know, it would be to me unimaginable that he didn't uh, delve into this once in a while, particularly with Madeira wine. It was just so easy. What about Kirk's testimony? He was a liar, <laughs> clearly. The question in my mind has always been, when he didn't make any report about 
Liberty, Hancock's Liberty, does that mean Hancock had paid him off? And so he was silent. And then when he changes his mind a month later, did he get offered more by the governor to offer that affidavit that there was smuggling? So Kirk's testimony is worthless. We learn about the power of the press. Oh, yes. Because all of these missteps were reported in excruciating detail in this Journal of Occurrences, Journal of the Times, all over America, repeated, 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 so that everyone knew from the view of the Patriot cause in Boston what was going on. It certainly solidified the opposition in Boston. Look at John Hancock. We might say that in the early 1760s, eh, you know, we're not quite sure where he's going to trim his sails. But persecution by the royal government changed that, didn't it? Made him a firm patriot for good motives or bad motives, but it pushed him into the patriot side. Samuel could now really count on him. He also becomes a bit of a martyr. He was illegally prosecuted. The crown dropped its case. It had proven himself. And the ministry, the government in London, what do we know about that? We know they're in chaos. We know that as time went on, their positions hardened, didn't soften. They didn't seek solutions. They became ever more fixed in their points of view and led by men who even for brief periods of time were, one could say, incompetent, simply incompetent, who didn't understand the issue. We can also say that in these 10 years, American political philosophy evolved and became far more fixed and identifiable. And that was the notion of self-government. That was the notion that John Ruddick had expressed in 1651 in the outskirts of the town of Sudbury. And now we were articulating it. We perhaps had felt it for some generations, but had never bothered to articulate it. But the events of the 1760s forced us to articulate our rights, our constitutional rights, as we define them. And then lastly, I would suggest to you the lesson here, if there is a lesson. The cascade of events. If any one of these events, and others that happened as well, had occurred in a long space of time, they would have been important, but I'm not sure they would have pushed Americans the way this did. It's kind of like picking up the paper every day and reading some new outrage. After a while, it just pushes the momentum. It starts a movement that in the end cannot be resisted. It has its own energy, its own momentum. And it's that cascade of events that made the revolution inevitable. Thank you all very much. How did you view the slow pace of communication between the colonies and England, which would be weeks, as contributing to the disarray, the lack of response, or the general uh, feeling by the colonists that nothing was changing? A very good question. Uh, the average uh, time voyage is uh, Boston to London, London to uh, Boston, <clears throat> would probably be somewhere in the area of six to eight weeks, depending upon winds. And generally speaking, there wasn't much communication during the winter. Okay? mostly in the spring, summer, and fall. So there was a great delay, that's true, so that ministers in London were making decisions on information uh, that was already at least probably three months old. Okay? And so that was always a problem. Although I must say, and, and clearly it is an issue, but in the 18th century, uh, that simply was the way it worked. Uh, so there, there was nothing special about that. Uh, and I don't think there's any evidence that had the ministry uh, had, the, had the ministry been, you know, had someone, had John Hancock tweeted, um, I'm not sure that it would have made any difference. In fact, I would suggest you, this is a pure speculation, that it might actually have accelerated things. 
uh, because the, the information would have been uh, uh, not filtered quite so much. Uh, so yes, it, but it did mean that they were making decisions based upon information that was three, maybe more months old. Yes, that's true. My understanding is that the non-importation uh, business, mm -hmm. um, people resisting things like cloth and paper and lead, the, the colonialists, uh, really was quite dramatic, even to the point of creating things like homespun, the concept of homespun, yes. Yes. and that there were informants and people would rat on each other if they were, n were using something they shouldn't, and it led indeed to things like tarring and feathering. <laughs> Can you address that? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there was a, a newspaper publisher here in Boston. His name was John Main, M-E-I-N, uh, and he was uh, a Tory publisher, a friend of the Tories. And he delighted in publishing lists of Boston merchants uh, who were violating the non-importation. Uh, on one occasion, John Hancock's name appears there. Uh, whether he actually did or not, again, don't know, but maybe, probably. Uh, so yes, there was a great deal of uh, spying, looking over your neighbor, were you obeying, were you drinking tea? Uh, the, uh, when they boycotted tea, and you write homespun cloth as well, they tried making tea from local products. Again, it was dreadful. <laughs> the tea, you know, whether it was sassafras or made out of oak leaves, I don't know. Uh, but that sort of thing was terrible. But yes, that, and to uh, have no luxuries, to eschew no luxuries, okay? uh, silks, for example, uh, none of that would be. And just, it, it did have an impact. It did have an economic impact uh, on the merchants in London. And when you look at the politics in Parliament, uh, there was always a significant segment of British members of Parliament who were, uh, if not necessarily in favor of the Americans, were not in favor of policies that cost them money. Remember, the colonies are, in fact, a huge market by 18th century standards, a huge market. And that market was being severely interrupted uh, by these actions of Parliament. So yes, the non-importation did, uh, did have an impact. And there were several of them as the crisis grew towards, uh, towards open rebellion. Could you speak a little bit more about uh, John Adams' defense of Hancock? Uh, Adams' defense of Hancock, and it's, by the way, uh, Adams' notes on his defense of John Hancock uh, in the Adams papers, the legal papers of John Adams. It's a rather long section which he had. Uh, he defended uh, Hancock attacking uh, the evidence, uh, attacking Kirk and attacking the others, uh, and made a, his, at least the notes in his legal papers, made a very effective argument against the unconstitutionality, the illegality, not necessarily hopping on John Hancock's innocence, okay, although he never admitted any guilt, but hopping on the conduct of the Crown, in this, the conduct of the Attorney General, uh, the, the star chamber kind of thing, the interviewing of witnesses in secret, uh, the violation of Hancock's personal property, et cetera, et cetera. So that is what Adams focused on, those things, which of course are fundamental principles that will be articulated uh, in the American Revolution. But Hancock's innocence of guilt, I think he sort of, well, he screwed side a bit. As any good attorney would, I suspect, with their client. Okay. Um, the native tribes that fought with the French against the British. I'm sorry? The, who? the native tribes that fought with the French, then allied with the British uh, 20 years later, uh, why did they almost change sides at that point uh, and, and fight with the crown? That's a very good question, and let me answer it two ways. The inclination of native peoples in North America to ally with the French during that period was based upon self-interest. Uh, they understood that the French, while colonizing, were not invaders, that the French colony, Quebec in that area, they were fur traders, uh, merchants. They were not farmers and settlers, except along the banks of the St. Lawrence River, where they did farm. And so therefore, the French did not present a great threat uh, to Indian lands or to Indian culture. The French assimilated, not assimilated, but were compatible really in many ways, the Jesuits, etc. And so the native people saw the French not necessarily as their allies, they had their own interests, but not as a great threat. On the other hand, the British were entirely different. Uh, for the British, there were two enemies in North America, trees and Indians, and they wanted to be rid of both. Uh, the British were settlers, they came in families, the proclamation line of 1763, 
was to prevent these British settlers from crossing the Appalachians and encountering the Native Americans. British settlement was, in fact, a cultural threat to Native peoples. American Revolution, you're right. It becomes a little bit, now we twist the clock a bit. In the American Revolution, Native peoples tended, again, not entirely, but tended to side with the British. Again, self-interest. Uh, the Americans were settlers and farmers moving west. Uh, the Americans, and were they not right, by the way, they were prescient. They were prescient in their fears. And so they tended then uh, to side with the British, although or less so than it had been the French Indian War. So in both instances, uh, I would suggest to you that the Native Americans understood well who their friends were, who their enemies were, and instinctively understood perhaps uh, what the future held for them, depending upon who emerged supreme in North America. And in that, they were right. Um, thank you very much again, Bill, for a really interesting presentation tonight.